Okay, now, before I let you go, maybe you can help me welcome our next guest, uh, James Staten, who's really a, a thought leader in the industry. He's a, he, he was a, recently a chief strategist at Microsoft Azure. True. Now he's at Forrester, and he's got a, a great vision and point of view on the industry, and a really great addition to, to our keynote today because he brings this industry-wide view of things. And he's also an admirable presenter, to be honest. He's a fantastic so presenter. Time. So get ready yes. for that. This will be uh, an elevation yeah. coming next. So <laughs> I think you will call James on stage. Yeah, let's have him James, come out here. Are you? Everybody, please welcome yes. James Staten. Thanks for having me, guys. Your audience. All right, thanks, James. I'll hand this over to you, okay. and I'll see you in a few minutes. Great, and thank you all for joining us and coming to this fantastic city when it's finally getting nice and warm after a really long winter down here. It is super exciting to be with you guys today to talk about this, and I was so glad to hear both of them talking about the change in the focus and the str strategy of SUSE, because that aligns with very much what we are seeing in all of our research and all of our surveys with enterprises and government agencies all around the globe. Because the big shift that all these organizations are going through is we have to get IT into a new position. And getting IT in a new position does not mean walking away from the technology, doesn't mean taking your focus away from the technology, but it is all about how do I reposition IT to be the engine of technology leadership, not as the managers of historical technology. And I know that all of you have run into some of these issues before in your organization. How many of you have identified a business unit or division in your company who brought in a technology and did not ask you if this is supported? <laughs> exactly. The reality of the world, shadow IT. But the reality for IT is to not just watch shadow IT happen, but how can you help your organization realize that what they saw as new technology needs that they thought IT wouldn't think about, that now, if they engage with IT, they can actually see how to take that thinking and that use of technology to the next level. And that is what our surveys have seen and what we've been doing in a lot of really deep engagements with clients. So let's talk real quickly on what is the state of the industry for those IT organizations that are making this transition. And a lot of their focus starts with the shift in their company's leadership, just as they were articulating. If your CEO and your C-suite organization are shifting away from just being knowledgeable about what your customers want, but now are being customer obsessed. This is the kind of change that happens in the organization. Let's put the slide up there so people can see this. The big change that we're seeing is your companies are moving away from simply having insights of what their customers are looking for and tactically what they might need from us to becoming customer-led, where everything about their strategy, everything about their vision is driven by what customers are saying are their goals, their mission, and their objectives. Not what they're saying tactically they need next, but what are they ultimately trying to accomplish. And this means not just gathering data about your customers, but turning those into insights that drive your roadmaps. And this also means moving away from trying to protect your existing products and say that they are perfect in meeting the customer needs and using the customer data to validate and verify that that is the case. No, what you need to do is embrace that your customers need more than what you provide today. And the faster that we can incorporate the feedback we're hearing from our customers and iterate and evolve our products and add new ones, the more value we can bring to them and the more alignment we can have to where they're ultimately trying to go. And in order to achieve this, you've got to move away from an organizational model where all these teams sit in silos and they function entirely on their own siloed KPIs. What you need to do instead is get them blending and sharing their insights and working collaboratively to accomplish these things. This is where you want your product, your marketing, and your IT organization to collaborate on where do we need to go, how do we empower that, and how do we make that happen. This is the shift to becoming more 
more customer obsessed because it's not just your sales and your support people who have the customer insights. It is IT who is collecting data from all across the company. And if you're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to aggregate and look at the analysis of that data, you in IT become the center point for what is indeed the customer insights that we as an organization need to drive from. Any IT departments here who have already achieved that? Okay, put it on your roadmap because that is critical. And again, I'm not saying do this in isolation in a silo. Do this in engagement with your organizations who are collecting that data, but also your ecosystem and also third parties who can bring in additional insights beyond what the customer tells you so that you can truly understand where is the customer ultimately trying to go and how do we get them there. And the companies that do this very effectively, as I mentioned before, are not simply just trying to protect the products they have. They are investing heavily in agility to increase the speed, but more importantly, in innovations. How do we become the technology innovator? How do we drive forward the values our customers are looking for? And as you can see, the companies that invest in these areas, they are achieving substantially faster growth than their peers and they are investing heavily in these departments. And as you can see in the last statistic on here, if they have seen some success from this, they are increasing that budget substantially. And this means investing in products you may not deliver in this fiscal year. You are investing in technologies and capabilities that might take longer than that to bring forth, might take 18 months, might take three years, might take 10 years. And if it takes 10 years, and I know most of you are like, what the heck? Why would I possibly invest in something that takes that long? Well, how many of you felt 10 years ago, you know, I would sure love to have my whole life on something this small? These are moonshots. These are the types of innovations you need to be thinking about. And that's how you can really take your customer relationships to the next level. So with NIT, what does that mean in terms of architectural change? That means shifting over to the services and capabilities that empower speed across all the things your company is building. Clearly, we've seen that happen in where you deploy your applications and why we're seeing so much adoption of containers now and moving away from just VMs and dedicated equipment uh, for your applications. Same thing true when we talk about the methodologies that you follow. Yes, we need to move away from waterfall methodologies into agile modes, but what you want to embrace as well, and some of your developers won't be thrilled with this, is you want to start automating how your applications learn and evolve using artificial intelligence. And we've done some tremendous research at Forrester around what we call the robotics quotient. And all of you should take a look at this because it's critically important to employee retention. Because so many employees, not just developers, not just IT, but all across your entire company, are worried. What do you mean you're going to bring in robotics and they're going to replace my job? No, I'm going to block them. I'm going to keep them out. Well, the reality is, if you look at where artificial intelligence and robotics can add the most value, they can do this in areas in which there are consistent services and capabilities within the job that are kind of boring to do on a regular basis. And if you take a look at this and say, wow, I actually can have artificial intelligence do this, think about it from the mindset of a developer. Which developers get super excited about doing incremental improvements and adding on new services and capabilities instead of building out new service and capability values that we have never delivered before? Well, AI won't do the latter. That's what your human skills need to do. Robotics and AI are very good at things that are well understood, and I can apply a single algorithm to them and do them. So if you can help your employees understand that artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics will complement their jobs and allow them to focus on how they can deliver new value and how they can partner with the robotics and find out when the robot made the wrong decisions because they used an old algorithm and how that algorithm needs to be adjusted in order to get to the next level, that is how you're going to achieve these big gains. And to go even beyond that, as is listed here in the third example, is you need to also think about how can I ensure that new applications and new services and capabilities can be built substantially faster. This is not just moving away from big single application elements. 
we do need to do a move away from that because your applications need to be closer to the customer and they need to be distributed and the ability to distribute as the needs of them change over time. But you also need to embrace the fact that you're going to be building out new services and capabilities for your customers that need to tie in to the historical information you had and the older applications that you did. Don't be thinking about, as I was pointing out on here, that I should take my old ERP system from Oracle and switch it to a mobile app. No. You should be building a mobile app that calls that Oracle system and uses and leverages that data. And that call, by the way, should be using artificial intelligence and it should be tapping an API. What you want to be building instead is not just mobile apps, but micro apps. And you want to be thinking about them as microservices. And not only do you want to empower your developers to be able to build these things, but you also want to be able to empower non-developers using low-code and no-code architectures where they can simply go into a website or go into an application and say, we need an app that does blah, 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 and then bang, it creates an app that does that. These are the things that will allow you to be way more agile, way more responsive to what you hear from your customers, and be more selective. Give them just the information they're looking for when they need it. And then on top of all that, you need platforms that enable you to do what I just described anywhere and everywhere that you need and to be able to not just have to do it in the public cloud, but be able to do it on premise, do it in a platform that spreads across the private and the public and empowers the edge and empowers the IoT value propositions. And we are so excited to see that investments in these areas are not just happening in the public clouds, but are now happening in platform extenders like SUSE. It is so critical that we see these investments happen because the reality for everybody is, as they were talking about in the previous session, we are all hybrid. Notice here that only, as you look at the green circle that's on there, notice that only 38% of organizations today are claiming to only use one cloud. All the rest are using multiples. All the rest are going hybrid and acknowledging that that is the reality that they're in today. And that's why it is so critical for you to partner with firms like SUSE who do empower hybrid and multi, but are not limited to IaaS, not limited to PaaS, but are investing in and empowering open source solutions across the entire value proposition we talked about. And that is really critical, and it's so good to hear how focused they are on you and what you're trying to accomplish. So take full advantage of that. As you are going down your transformational path, reach out to them, tell them what you need, and if they don't have it in their portfolio, don't worry about that. Tell them what you really need, because they are now focused, as they said, on you and empowering you, and that means they're going to put things on the roadmap you say should be there. And if you say you need it by the end of 2019, don't be surprised if they actually deliver it in that time frame. So as a partner, engage. Don't just expect, engage. And in addition to the technologies we talked about up to this point, think about the emerging technologies that are going to provide the ability for you to deliver net new values to your customers as well. We are talking about things like IoT, which we, of course, have seen quite a bit growing into this market, but we are going to see it take off between 2019 and 2024. We are going to get to the point where every vehicle out there in the road is not only having sensor information, but is going to be talking to other vehicles to figure out where to go. And I'm not talking just about cars. We're, we're already seeing this happen in the busing industry. We've seen this for quite a few years in the, in the airline industry. We're going to continue to see this in every aspect. And we're going to eventually get to the point where there are going to be more things and that you touch and that you work with that are IoT empowered than we as people are. And so how can your company take advantage of that? You need to be thinking about a lot of the emerging technologies like blockchain, which, by the way, is not just a finance play. You need to be looking at AI and artificial intelligence. You need to be looking at edge computing. You need to be looking at all of the other emerging tech areas that you should be investing in and thinking about how can they empower your company's value. Because with those level of investments, you will be your industry's market disruptor. And if you want to be a leader in 2025, 
That is what is necessary to get there. And any of you who have done analysis where you've looked at the Fortune 500 companies, all you have to do is go back 10 to 15 years and see how many companies that were in the Fortune 500 at that time are still in the Fortune 500 today. Guess how many? 30%. The rest stuck to their old way of doing business, stuck to trying to protect their existing business. Wrong. Focus on getting to the next level. Hope this is valuable to you guys. Thanks so much for your time. Hey. Great. All right, James, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. Hey, and thanks for being here again. It's Always great good. to have you back at Suzicon once again. And, and many of the folks here probably don't realize this, but James and I were doing Suzicon together, what was it, 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And if you think about all the topics that, that Nils and I talked about, that you just talked about, how much has changed since the last time we were together on a Suzicon stage? Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff has changed. So. Also, what's amazing is a lot of those things that have changed, they're being driven by open source innovation. So let's maybe talk, unpack a little bit more about, uh, from your point of view, how does open source, the open source development and innovation model, fuel and accelerate all this innovation that we're talking about? Yeah, and this, this is what I find so fascinating, because it used to be that open source was the exception to yeah. technology development. Now, we are seeing almost every leader in the technology industry open sourcing their own technologies. And the reason that they're doing this is because they empower a broader ecosystem. They take away some of the risks people have about being locked into a particular mm -hmm. solution. But more importantly, they empower communities to advance and extend those technologies. And that happens way faster than any dedicated engineering team yeah. who has to build that roadmap, make the business case, and carry it forward. It's a multiplier effect, right, of, of creating that community. And you have contributors from the businesses that are, that are utilizing the technology as well as whole communities that are interested in those topics creates this huge momentum. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, and I've been so excited when I was at Microsoft that we were very much against open source in our architecture. But thankfully, under Satya, we have seen the value of carrying it forward. And now Microsoft is contributing a lot of yeah. its own intellectual property to open source rather than just consuming and making it possible for you to consume open source through them. So one thing that you mentioned I think is really interesting is sort of you know, there's, for a long time, there's been open source companies like SUSE that, can, that work upstream and contribute to open source. There's been a lot of technology vendors that work upstream and contribute to open source. But what you're talking about is more than that, right? It's almost like a next, an evolutionary step beyond that. So let's talk a little bit of, more about that, because that's a big change, right? And, yeah. and I think a lot of companies are, are a little afraid of that change. Yeah, and you're exactly bringing up something that all of you should be thinking about, not just the vendor community should be thinking about. Because what is one of the biggest values that comes from open source? Ecosystem empowerment. And if you can not only get your ecosystem to feel, oh, this is no longer proprietary, we can now do this in more ways, but oh, I didn't know I could contribute to it. Yeah. I didn't know that if I expanded it and wanted to use it over here, I could actually define what that means and right. I could bring that message in. That is incredibly empowering. And you should be thinking about that not just from the technologies you use and how you may use them in different ways, but what are the technologies you yourselves built and how can you better empower your ecosystem? And it's really empowering when they tap into this and realize, oh, wow, we could actually apply this across the entire industry. Yeah. And that last statement is the one that holds a lot of enterprises back. Like, wait, that means that we're going to create new intellectual property and our competitors yeah. are going to use it too? That's well, crazy talk. That's crazy talk. <laughs> but I'll give you a good example of how this is actually coming out positive. Tesla took all of its patents from this first design of its electric cars and has now open sourced them and available to them to the rest of the auto industry. And as a result, we have seen a 30% increase in their overall investments yeah. in the future of electric vehicles. That's a great example. So, and, and then one of the other, the other fears, there's the IP fear, right, of, oh, that's our differentiation, right? How do we differentiate without that? Uh, versus making that part of accelerating the whole industry and then differentiating on top of that. Another fear or, or 
resistance that often comes up or hurdle is the is security. How you know? How, am I going to be secure? Am I going to somehow expose my my private data or customer data if I utilize this open source innovation, mm -hmm. right? Or if I become part of it and contribute to it? Yeah, yeah. And if you think that doing something proprietary is what's going to protect your differentiation in the market, be prepared for your differentiation to be a limited market that does not grow as fast as the one that open sources. And when you, we talk about open source, it doesn't mean open sourcing your entire answer to the problem. Open right. sourcing the baseline of how that got done is what you should be thinking about. And from a security perspective, yes, a lot of people draw the conclusion that, oh, it's open source. All these hackers know how to get into it. All these hackers can break it. Right. The power of open source, as we talked about how everyone in the community can contribute, is actually what leads to better security. Because as soon as someone has figured out how to hack it, you don't have to wait and say, when is this going to become a priority for the proprietary research firm that's trying to advance this? Oh, everybody can solve it? And so the first company that has experienced the security breach can apply the update? That is where this power comes in. And that's where companies Absolutely. like SUSE are so differentiated from some of their competitors in open source adoption, because they embrace the latest versions of the open source community technologies. They don't sit there and wait 18 to 24 months after the enhancements have been made to then add it to their product line. Right. And, and part of the magic of that open source development model is that we work together with our other peers in the industry, even our competitors in the industry, to find and address those things immediately. And, and we, don't, we don't wait for a customer to come to us with a problem. And because the code is open source, anybody can be examining that and identifying issues at any time. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fantastic model. Oh, yeah. So now let's, let's shift uh, slightly to another topic. And, and you know, when I teed up your session, I talked about how you were going to share the, the changing role of IT in the organization. And a lot of our folks here in the audience are actually in the IT world themselves in a variety of different roles. So let's talk a little bit about how you see different types of IT roles changing and what that means. Oh, absolutely. And according to the surveys we've done of C-suite executives across large enterprises all across the globe, Sadly, only about 40% of them view IT as doing more than simply, as I mentioned at the beginning, managing the historical technology in their organization. And if that's the role that your IT position is in, that's what you need to address first and foremost. And that means setting a mission for how you're going to do that and showing the evidence of how you do it. And there's two paths that you want to be going down. One is you want to become a change leader. How can you demonstrate to them that you are investing in the future technologies and you can help the business carry it forward? And a lot of that focus should not just be on customer experience. As I mentioned before, that should be primary. But you should also be looking at employee experience. Mm -hmm. Because in order to get those other C-suite people to say, wow, I didn't know IT could do this cool stuff, you want to think about how can I improve their lives and how they work and how they engage with customers. And that can help get them to the next level. And if you succeed at doing this, then they will want to partner with you. And that's what you want that ultimate role of IT to be, the business partner for tech enablement. And if they truly are saying, I want to engage with you, you've gotten there. Yeah, that's how you know you're there, right? Exactly. You remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, remember when the, the big IT headline was, IT is dead? Remember that? I mean, it, it, we've come a long ways from there. It's a completely different landscape. Oh, yeah. You know, where, where this is this new generation of technologies driven by open source innovation creates this opportunity for IT to become such a strategic driver of the business mm -hmm. that it's, it's absolutely an amazing, wonderful time to be there. Now, um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is, is some concrete, specific recommendations that you have for, for people that are in IT roles within those companies, but also for those of us like, like Sousa who are, are providing technologies uh, to dr help help those leaders reach their goals. So mm -hmm. maybe both vendor-oriented and, and customer-oriented recommendations. Yeah, and across both of those boundaries, the first recommendation, as I talked about at the beginning, is what you should do. Shift your organization to customer obsession. Mm -hmm. Not just gathering data on your customers, but understanding where are they trying to go and what does that mean we need to change in how we deliver and how can our partners help us achieve those deliveries. That's the first thing you want to focus on. Then the second one, how do we show 
our organization, how we can carry it forward, and that we are making the right investments in these emerging technologies and capabilities, and how we can drive much faster delivery of our services and capabilities for our organization. And then you really want to be looking at how can I change my corporate culture overall to being one that is an adaptive enterprise, one that is not so busy protecting its historical revenues mm -hmm. and so focused on its tactical KPIs and our existing you know, services and capabilities and our existing customers, but how can we focus on expanding all of that? Because that is the key to being a leader in the future. Yeah. Because your existing customers and the buyer inside the firm of that existing customer might have a limited view of what you can deliver to them and why they should engage you. And if you can get beyond that, that will drive your company to the next level. All right, well, before we wrap up, this session, mm -hmm. maybe just a couple, any uh, insights or observations about Sousa and, and now that we are just launched ourselves as an independent company, what, what do you see as, as the future for Sousa? Well, what I'm super excited about of being independent is that you guys can now 100% set the vision going forward. And as you both articulated this morning, it is dead on with what we're seeing as customer obsession. And that is critical. And what is also so empowering is that a lot of people's historical views of engaging with SUSE have been around open source operating system, right. and then going up the stack to IaaS, and then going up the stack to PaaS. But no, you guys are not limiting yourself to an infrastructure-centric value. You're now expanding into application empowerment, application right. design, data collection, data analysis. And so you can be an engine to help them take their customer insights and turn them into customer obsession. I like that, I like that phrase, customer obsession. I'm going to use that if you don't mind. Okay All right. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much for being with us again Absolutely. at SUSECON. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Thanks James Staten. Great. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Now, before we wrap up, let me say just a couple housekeeping words to you before I send you off to those fantastic sessions that we've been talking about. First of all, I want to reference the technology showcase that I mentioned earlier. That's one floor down from here. And in there, you're going to find all kinds of exhibits from our various sponsors, as well as our SUSE technology experts. That's a, a whole ecosystem of technology and partners and interesting stuff that you're not going to want to miss. Now, you also know, if you already know SUSECon, we love to have some cool prizes. And part of uh, part of winning those prizes is engaging in various conference activities. So I want to make sure that you notice in your backpack of cool stuff, there's a particular flyer here. And this will tell you everything that you need to know about how to be in the best position to win those cool prizes. And we do have some really cool stuff. We've got some Nintendo Switch devices. We've got some 3D printers. We've got some noise-canceling headphones, some really cool stuff. Uh, and then you have to make sure that you're at the demo palooza that I talked about Thursday afternoon to make sure you win. Now, last thing before I let you go, Susan music videos. We love doing our music videos. One thing we love even more is having you become part of those music videos. So as we wrap up here, I'm going to show a music video. And then what we're going to do over the next couple of days is the film crew is going to run around and engage with you guys, film you doing fun stuff, and then you will become part of the next version of the video you're about to see. So don't miss the conference party tonight because that's going to be the perfect place to get your debut and become part of the next Sousa music video. All right, listen, watch this, and then have a great day. I'll see you here tomorrow morning. Thanks, everybody.